Good morning. Well, next, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. And the topic of population health will define our new reality. And all the things that we talked about earlier all kind of help set the stage for us to really execute in the world that's ahead of us. Dr. David Nash is a board-certified internist who is internationally recognized for his work in population health, outcomes management, medical staff development, and quality of care improvement. He was named the founding dean of the Jefferson School of Population Health in 2008. Dr. Nash is also a consultant to organizations in both the public and private sectors and has been repeatedly named to Modern Healthcare's list of most powerful persons in healthcare. Through publications, public appearances, and his online writing, Dr. Nash reaches more than 100,000 people each month. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Nash. See you. Good morning, Nashville. All right, you guys had some coffee this morning. Hey, this is uh, wonderful to be here. I was thinking about the last two weeks in August. What other industry has a gigantic meeting in Opryland the last two weeks in August, other than healthcare? And that's because we never stop working. That's really the theme. So I'm thrilled to be here. I appreciate all of you taking time out and uh, what a wonderful organization to be a part of even for a day. All of you who work through the Health Trust, uh, just fantastic. Uh, can we take a second to just recognize a couple of people, most especially uh, Faye Porter, one of the key staff people. Can we have a round of applause for their entire team? You know, when you come to an event like this, of this size and scope, it all looks easy, but there's an incredible amount of hard work that goes on behind the scenes. So thanks, thanks for that acknowledgement. Uh, well, I'm your uh, opening act. When they uh, picked me up at the airport last night, the really friendly Opryland driver said, so are, are you the comedian? <laughs> and I said, uh, well, we'll find out, won't we? Uh, so, really wonderful to be a part of this. So, as your uh, opening speaker, I, I have a big job. So, I'm in charge of a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, big picture. What's the big picture? Second is get you psyched and ready for the rest of the meeting. And uh, hopefully, leave you with a couple of uh, key take-home messages. And tomorrow, what a treat that you've got Elizabeth Smart as your headliner. Tomorrow, my wife wanted to come just to see her for sure. What about me? That was not a key issue. <laughs> OK, so here's our agenda for the next uh, 50 minutes or so. So population health, this is a pretty big deal. And Ed alluded to it a lot in his uh, wonderful opening comments. You all understand the basics. We're turning this battleship around inside the Panama Canal. Of course, that doesn't really work that well. So how are we going to do this? So I'm going to make four main points in my limited time with you this morning. So first, a little bit of background. How do we get in the jam that we're in? This should be review for everybody here. Second part of our time, we're going to talk a little bit about what is exactly population health. Since you're the only school of population health in the country at Jefferson, we believe we're helping a little bit to define the field. So part one, how do we get in this jam? Part two, what the heck is this? population health stuff anyway. Part three, how does it connect to health reform, following nicely on Ed's comments. And then I'm going to look into my cloudy crystal ball and give you Nash's view of the future. So one more time, overview, population health, health reform, what does it all mean? So for those of you whose uh, Philadelphia geography isn't what it ought to be, of course, Philadelphia, birthplace of our nation, our nation's uh, previous capital. Three blocks from my office is Independence Place. Also home of five medical schools and 90 Joint Commission accredited hospitals, many of them in the audience. What does that mean? Well, healthcare is the second biggest business in Philadelphia. It also means if you have to walk more than five blocks for a cardiac cath, it's incredibly inconvenient. This is the picture of the floor of our 
gymnasium, home of our undefeated basketball team. And that's because we don't got one. <laughs> Jefferson University is just healthcare. Our 600 plus bed university hospital and our six schools arrayed around the hospital, medical school, nursing, pharmacy, allied health, graduate science, and us, the leanest, meanest, newest, most agile school of population health. So I hope you'll come and visit us too. So whatever your politics, you know, we ain't here to talk about it, but uh, what a cool cover, huh? And get a load of the size of that syringe he's holding too. And I think as Ed alluded to, and I know you're going to be working on this afternoon and tomorrow, hey, you ain't seen nothing yet. The pain level, pain level isn't there, but we're here to a little bit to talk about where we're headed. So a little hard to see in the back of the room, but this is a direct citation from the founding of the American College of Surgeons in the First World War. And you could read along with me. All integrated delivery systems like Jefferson are accountable to the public for their degree of success. If this initiative isn't taken by you and me, it will be taken by the lay public. 1918, World War I. Pretty incredible when you think about it. A pretty prescient group of guys, no girls in this group. Nearly 100 years ago, I would argue, thinking about many of the same issues we're going to hammer this morning and I know you'll be working on later today as well. So the title for my presentation that we are so happy to be here today is called Demand Better is Population Health the Answer. And this grew out of the work of uh, my mass market book called Demand Better. We didn't come here to sell books, although at three cents per book, you know, you never know what kind of margin you could make at a meeting like this. But the reality is we've got some challenges, so let's drill into them. So everybody here is aware we're moving from a world of more is better to maybe that's not the right thing to do in the first place. From more caths and more endoscopies and more parking spots, that's really important at Jefferson in Philadelphia. More buildings, maybe that's not the right strategy. And the strategy that you're all a part of, and certainly Health Trust is a big part of, is what's the value equation? What are we getting for the money we're spending? And so here's one magazine cover moving from volume to value. But I think we could really summarize it with this fantastic slide that I stole from the CEO of BayCare in Tampa, Florida. So here's this hapless house officer, and he's poised between these two canoes. And one canoe, of course, is the road to redemption, practicing population-based, value-oriented care. And the other canoe is, well, you know, more is better private practice fee for service, we do whatever the heck we like, no antibiotic stewardship, let's just stock every prosthesis we could think of, let's order whatever the heck we want, when we want, with very little evidence about what the heck we're doing, you know all about that. So the way I see it, he's got three choices, right? He could fall into the drink and call it a day, he could sail off into the sunset and more is better. What he doesn't know is that 200 feet from here is a one mile down into the abyss. Or he could figure it out and sail off into the population health value-based canoe. Now, of course, it makes for a great picture. How exactly we do this is not easy. And we have to appreciate some real challenges. Let me put my clinical hat on for a second. So all the clinicians in the room, pharmacists, nurses, a couple of docs, you and I know what? Well, you and I know that um, a lot of guesswork out there even makes the cover of what was Business Week magazine, now Bloomberg Business, courtesy of Mayor Bloomberg. But what does this really say? Move that doctor around on that roulette wheel, kind of a tough cover for doctors for sure. But the message is, about 18% of what we do is based on solid grade A evidence. 18%. Let's round it off. One out of five decisions, we got solid science behind it. The other four out of five decisions, you and I know, doors are closed, we're among a lot of friends here. We call that the art of medicine. The problem is the people who pay the bills are not connoisseurs of great art. And therein lies a key problem for us. So one out of five decisions with solid science behind it. Now, 
way back in 1998, Don Berwick, and in case you don't know, of course, he's running for governor of the People's Republic of Massachusetts. I think he has a pretty good shot at it. Way back in 98, Don said, hey, it's possible to actually lower cost and improve quality. After all, that's what this whole meeting is all about. So how would you go about to do that? Well, here's the Institute of Medicine checklist. And again, if you're all the way in the back, a little tough, but the main thing is, hey, let's reduce medical error. You know, in all this conversation about reform, we seem to have forgotten that medical error is the fourth leading cause of death in our country. You heard me right, not at Jefferson or at your place, but everywhere else, whoever's not here, this is a huge problem. So we got to lick that. And then we could get into the weeds, preventing avoidable hospital admissions. Well, you know, that sounds great unless you're a J. Seal CFO at Loyola, then you're in a jam because you're going to have empty beds. But you and I know it's all about care coordination, practicing based on the evidence, reducing variation, getting those docs to hone the line. That's the hard work. That's the jam that we're really in. Now we need some definitions. Here's the 1991 definition of quality, still the most widely accepted one, and you could read it along with me, but basically it's got three components. A population focus, 1991, ask patients what's important to them, imagine that, and practice based on the evidence. Of course, this was followed in 1999, we're talking 14 years ago come September, Bill Clinton held this book up in the press room of the White House and said, I'm going to devote my administration to reducing his words, the epidemic of medical error. Epidemic of medical error. That was 14 years ago next month. Holy cow. How are we doing? Well, uh, here's front page Wall Street Journal last year, right before Thanksgiving. If this didn't spoil your appetite for turkey, I don't know what would. Or how about this, my favorite cover story, Time Magazine, four summers ago, what do doctors hate about hospitals? Of course, you know the answer, being a patient in one. So we're not here specifically to talk about medical error, but we gotta lick this too before we could think about that value equation and moving from volume to value. Wait, there's more. So everybody here remembers 2001, ancient history, crossing the quality chasm and the so-called six domains, and you have them memorized, I'm sure, delivering care that's safe, effective, efficient, timely, patient-centered, and equitable. This is sort of the land of Oz. When you get to Oz, you know you will have crossed the quality chasm. These are the challenges that we face. Let's summarize. We spend a ton. Not sure what the value we're currently getting. As Ed alluded to, we're headed toward 20% of the GDP. You know, on a good day, that sounds pretty good to me. 20% of the GDP focused on our industry, right on. Little problem with that is, of course, you know, no national defense, no new schools, no bridges, and in Philadelphia, no repair of those potholes. So that's super important. Okay, so part two. Population health. Everybody has his own definition. And I'm not going to tell you that ours is the only right one, but hang in there with me. So we're going to define population health and then link it to health reform in the next section. So where did this come from? Well, generally, we like to give credit to Dr. David Kindig, K-I-N-D-I-G, who coined this corny term, population health, 35 years ago. That's right. 35 years ago, David was writing about the fact that population health probably has three core components, and I've listed them here for you. The outcomes of care, everybody here is pretty familiar with, morbidity, mortality, quality of life. Then the determinants of those care, things like medical care, the laying on of hands, but also explicit recognition that poor people are sicker. That's right the social determinants of health outcome. And then the third component, policies and interventions like the Affordable Care Act. Main message, the social determinants, the behavioral components are actually critical. Another way to look at this in a picture format, 
this little purple box way up here called medical care, what you and I are involved in every day, that's 15% of the story. I, I know you're shaking your head, but 85% of the problem is not what goes on inside the four walls of Jefferson or of your great place. 85% of it is outside of those four walls. Socioeconomic status, education, crime. Let's talk about Philadelphia. Nation's sixth largest city by population of the nation's top 10 cities, it's the poorest. The lowest average per capita household income of the nation's top 10 cities. 60% of our public school students in K through 12 in downtown Philly are obese. 60%. 25% of our adult inhabitants smoke, 5% above the national average. You get the idea. So despite five medical schools, we've got a huge population health challenge in our town. And 15% of it has to do with what goes on inside the walls of those big institutions. Right here in Brentwood, suburb of Nashville, we've got great organizations like health media leaders and others trying to say, okay, we're gonna give you a lot more information about population health. That's in part what we're doing here today. When we opened the doors to our school just four years ago, I had this terrible dream the night before school opened. You know, you think kids worry about the first day of school. Let me tell you something. Deans are shaking in their boots the night before school starts. I realized we have a school of population health we don't have a textbook. How could you have a school and not a textbook? Didn't make any sense, so we had to edit the first ever textbook on population health, creating a culture of wellness, our scholarly journal, population health management, but you didn't come here to learn about the books and the journals. But here's what's going on around the country. We're starting to see publications like this one from our team, the population health mandate that says, hey, we've got to reach outside those four walls. We're going to need to deal with docs in the community, pharmacists in the community, nursing homes, extended care facilities, home infusion. We're going to have to coordinate all of this, link all of this from the board of trustees to your hospital to the folks delivering the home infusion medication. That's going to have to be a well-oiled, organized, value-generating team. Well, that's a big operational challenge, I'm sure you would agree. How about the title to this fantastic piece from a group in Washington? It says, A Healthier America in 2013, Strategies to Move from Sick Care to Health Care. Well, how exactly are we going to do that? Well, let's, we'll need registries of all of our patients. We'll need physician education. We'll need, believe it or not, maybe we'll need new relationships with our managed care partners like Humana, Aetna, and others. It's a whole new way of looking at how we're delivering care at the bedside and in the community. Maybe what we're trying to do, try this. Maybe we're trying to operationalize the triple aim. You all remember the triple aim for sure, right? Better health of the population, lower per capita cost, better experience of care population per capita cost experience of care. Maybe we need better measures of what we mean by population well-being. Is it reducing readmission? That might be one. Reducing overall admission? Well, depending on where you're sitting, that might be another good measure. Smoking cessation, obesity reduction. You'll see in a moment how tough these measures might be. In our work with the consulting group SG2, I know many of you know them out of Skokie, we just did a webinar, and this is just one slide from that webinar that I thought sort of summarized a lot of where population health is going. We're gonna need a primary care network. Well, let me move over here just to emphasize. So Jefferson University physicians, the 750 full-time medical school faculty members, my colleagues back in Philadelphia, of the 750 docs at our place, 50 are in primary care. 50 out of 750. Do you think that's the right ratio to make this kind of strategy work? Well, we'll leave that 
for the question and answer period. So here's the real challenge. You know, um, colleagues, uh, I had the privilege of speaking at Catholic Health East Trinity a couple of weeks ago, and I showed this slide. Then I thought, uh-oh, hope the sisters aren't going to get mad at me. <laughs> but is that great? So I stole this from Sue Denser at Health Affairs, and you know, he's back. This is the American version of Michelangelo's David in Florence, Italy. If, uh, if we were to sculpt it today, this is what he would look like. And here's what I mean. So you and I know, especially here in wonderful southern part of our great country, we got all kinds of challenges. Obesity, physical inactivity, stress, not picking your parents wisely, all of that. <laughs> all of that contributing to some major behavioral issues. So we're going to do a quiz. I know we got 3,700 people, but we're going to do a quiz. So colleagues, based on the best available evidence, reference here, Annals of Internal Medicine 2006, what percentage of adults do all five of these things? Let's go through them quickly. Exercise, you know, the way you're supposed to do. Don't smoke cigarettes or cigars. Eat their fruits and vegetables like their mom taught them. Wear their seatbelt. And since we're here in Nashville, we'll say number five, close to an appropriate body mass index. Okay, drum roll. What percentage of adult Americans do all five things? Hold on, drum roll, here we go. And the answer is, of course, 3%. Big round of applause, come on, big round, that's it, 3%. Here's our culture, here's our culture. We're gonna take our Lipitor on the way to McDonald's, and guess what? We'll buy the Big Mac, you buy the Lipitor. That's how we like it. Now, that's America. You know, that, that, that's part of our culture. It, it's like the wagon trains going out west, rugged individualism. You get the idea. So here's my question, and we're presaging part three. Do you want these people in your accountable care organization? That's the kind of challenge we're going to be facing. So today, if I made rounds in some of the great hospitals right here in Nashville, we would know that 40 plus percent of all the admissions are still due to smoking, unhealthy diet, lack of physical activity, and based on what I saw last night walking around this place, alcohol. <laughs> so this is still a big issue for us, and we've got to figure out how to tackle it. From a public policy perspective, population health still not on the radar screen at the National Institutes of Health and all the other federal agencies. We're talking 2%. Everything else headed on a disease basis. When care coordination and chronic illness is where it's all at. You all remember, of course, President Nixon, the 1972 declaration of the war on cancer, scores of billions of dollars, scores. 38 years of work, and basically the number one contribution to cancer death decreasing has been smoking cessation. Not the building of all the NIH cancer centers, and believe me, I get it, that research is important. But from a policy perspective, the biggest bang for the buck has been behavioral change. So we can do it, we can do it, it's gonna take a concerted effort, we're going to have to align those economic incentives. We're going to have to practice a new kind of medicine called population-based medicine. Challenge with that is it ain't taught in medical schools. So let's transition out of part two, population health. Here's Newsweek last summer, my favorite cover story. One word that will save your life in our business, and that one word is no. No test, no procedure. No PSA, no prostate ultrasound, you get it. No is the word that we need to be thinking about. So let's go then and try to link all this to reform. And I'm not going to get into the weeds of the 2,100 pages. Only nerds like us like reading that. I'm going to give you my sense of the quality agenda built into reform and how we can connect it with population health. So here's the question. 
Have we reached the Malcolm Gladwell tipping point? Still, I think, his best book. Have we reached the point where, OK, we all get it. We're going to leave Nashville after tomorrow all fired up and ready to go to practice population-based care. Are we ready to do it? I think that's a kind of a critical question. So here's the team. Now, you know, you've got to have a lot of chutzpah to show your family's photograph in front of 3,700 people. And as my adult children have now told me, this is not HIPAA compliant. I got no permission to do this, and I'm sure I'm going to hear about it, but I'm showing you this for a couple of reasons. First, you know, pretty good looking group here. We got Leah, Jacob, Esther, David, and Rachel. I got the entire Old Testament lined up right here, right here. <laughs> but beside that, so Rachel and Leah, well, they're twins. Leah is three minutes older. They're now 26 years old. They're both in our business. Leah works for the Center for Medicare Innovation in Washington, D.C. I got a daughter inside Medicare. My God, that's a scary thought. <laughs> and Rachel, in the purple, she's a fourth year medical student. So here's the punchline. Rachel could be your doctor one day. She knows a lot of medicine already. She's going to be in practice God willing, in 2040. Think about that for a second. Holy macro. But are we building the right kind of doctor, policy person for the future? That's a core question. That's a core question. Oh, and while I'm up here, so my son Jake is 22. He needs a job. Could somebody please help me? <laughs> See me afterwards. Okay. Finally, 